All right. Welcome to this edition of more, yet even more stories from the Secret City, <laughs> the Oracle class for February the 13th. I'm glad to have all of you here. Uh, I'm looking forward to our sessions together. I'm going to show just a couple of slides and then I'm going to introduce Alan and uh, mm -hmm. let him bring us up to date on what's happening with the American Museum of Science and Energy and the K-25 History Center. And then uh, I have a, 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 some, I have a story or two to share with you, of course. But as always, I want you to ask questions and to uh, insert your thoughts and, and stories as well. You know, uh, you know stories about Oak Ridge too. So we want to have a conversation and uh, and we'll do that this Monday and then the next two Mondays. So let me share my screen for just a moment and uh, show you a couple of things just so you know what what's going to be coming down. I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing myself. Mm -hmm. I think all of you know me well enough. I, I don't need that anymore. I am still the historian for the city of Oak Ridge and I'm on my second term as a commissioner for the Tennessee Historical Commission. And that's probably enough to say about that. Now, let me give you some insight into what's gonna, what's gonna be coming on down the road. Uh, today, we've got Alan Lowe, who's gonna give us an up, update on the American Museum of Science and Energy and the K-25 History Center and other things that he's doing, like his AMSI cast and those things mm -hmm. that are uh, coming up that we might not be aware of. And then on the 20th, we have Carla Mullins from the Oak Ridge History Museum, who will do the same thing, just give us an update on, on the museum. And then I, I've, I, I, I need to change that date. I uh, have Mike coming on the 20th as well. And uh, he will talk about the Oak Ridge Room. And if you've not been to the Oak Ridge Room lately, you really need to go. He's got some really good things going there. And then on the 27th, we have Ian Wilder of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. He will come and give us some insight onto what's going on with the park. And Emily Jernigan, I've asked her to come and talk about Flatwater Tales. They're coming up in uh, June of this year. And the thing I'm so excited about, Bill Lepp has, has been all of our, all of our Flatwater Tales, he has been our feature, one of our features. He's the only one that's been to every uh, event that we've had. And this year, he is going to tell the story of Oak Ridge's prophet, John Hendricks. So I'm <laughs> delighted that, that he wants to do that. And I'm interested in hearing what he has to say. Now, I have muted all of you. So if you need to and want to say something, you need to unmute yourself and say it. But uh, And you can do that with Alan as well as me. I, Alan, I'll take that freedom. But when people have questions, sure. it makes the presentations go even better. So if you see something you want to ask a question about any time, during what Alan's talking about or any time I'm talking. I don't care if I'm in the middle of a, what looks like a formal presentation. If you'll ask me a question, we'll all get more out of what we're doing by entertaining your questions. So just unmute yourself and speak up. All right, we have Alan Lowe here with the American Museum of Science and Energy. I'm really glad to have you here with us, Alan. If you'll share your screen, you can uh, of course. go ahead and start. I will do it. Let's see here. Share. It well, Ray, we did this earlier. I'm, now I'm messing it up. Well, no, it helps when you talk to it. So tell it what you want it to do. <laughs> I know. I know. Hang, hang on one second. Let's see. There, there, I'm back. Okay. What is going on here? This thing is doing weird stuff to me. Look at that. There we go. I'm going to go back over here. Uh, I'm going to go back to my video. Sorry about that, guys. Okay. All right. So we, we now I need to go back to my. So we've all been <laughs> in the wearing hats, trying to get Zoom. I'm, I'm trying to share it now. Where, doggone it. Where did I do this earlier? 
Well, it's down to bottom. Share screen. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Very strange. Okay, I I had it, and it what? There you go. I keep hitting the wrong button, and that's just the way I am. There you go. I'm, you'll see, I'm drinking coffee throughout this whole thing, so that's the problem. Ninety nine. I need more coffee. Time, Alan, it's operator error. Okay. There you. Go. Oh, it's me. It was me just hitting the wrong button. I thought I was hitting the right one, so I apologize for that. And and oh. as I told uh, some of you earlier, my video every now and then will also look crazy. And I will try to take care of that when it happens. So again, uh, great uh, to join you. Uh, Ray, thank you for this opportunity uh, to speak. I know uh, Ray told me some of you have been in classes before where I've, I've given the uh, overview of both museums and perhaps some of you haven't. So I'll, I'll try to, uh, to speak to both of those groups today as we go through uh, talking about the museums, what's going on now and what we have planned for the future. Uh, it's hard to believe, Ray, I've been here since 2019, so we're, we're going to be coming up, I guess, on four years. It's it's uh, Time flies when you're having fun, and we are definitely having fun here. We yeah. are indeed. So um, one of the big changes, and those of you who've heard me before know this, is that in 2021, we were able to change the model of operations for both AMSI and the K-25 History Center to where they're now both operated by the nonprofit AMSI Foundation. And raised on the executive committee of that, Jim Campbell is the president of that of that um, of that board of directors. Uh, we have a great board now of twenty uh, folks, uh, and it's been a really good arrangement under what's called a cooperative agreement with the Department of Energy, which really means they still give us uh, very good support, but we are also now uh, focused on making that nonprofit stand up and uh, run these museums so that they are healthy now and into the future. So I'm really proud of what we've accomplished so far. It's given us great flexibility in our programming and fundraising, all those things that a nonprofit status allows you to do uh, while still being very appreciative to our friends at the Department of Energy. Uh, I hope you've all been to the, um, let me go here to the next thing here, to the American Museum of Science and Energy, you know, moved to the new location in 2018. I think the exhibits are terrific. I look at the Manhattan Project, we look at uh, national security, talk a lot about uh, the work at Y-12 in that part, and talk about the nuclear Navy. That's a new case we've just added. We talk about big science, things like uh, supercomputing and nanotechnology and neutron spallation, all these things that Alan, as a history major, has had to learn a lot about the last four years, but that really have changed and continue to change the world that our partners at ORNL and Y-12 and EM all those parts of DOE have accomplished, are accomplishing, are planning. And we talk about that and then use it as a springboard to talk about even broader issues of STEM. Um, so we are what we call a real steam engine. Our educators work every day and we'll talk more about this in a minute. But at the base of that is this really terrific interactive exhibit at AMSI. Now there've been some changes at AMSI and some changes that we have planned. Uh, if you haven't been, Recently, the uh, part in the middle on, on the bottom of the slide, uh, the Eureka sculpture is something new that the East Tennessee Children's Hospital gave us. It's a wonderful kinetic sculpture uh, by a famous sculptor named George Rhodes. And it's been a real uh, hit with our visitors and helps us talk about things like forces of motion and so forth. It's a little loud, as Ray can tell you, uh, when it's going, uh, but I like a little noise every now and then in the museum. It's been a really, really good addition. We're also uh, talking to RNL about improving our energy section, where we talk about already things like fission and fusion, but we want to focus a bit more on fusion. So that's coming, I hope, in the fairly near future. And we've also I've been trying recently to get a grant to do a little more on solar energy as well in the energy section at AMSI. Now, one uh, big change, well, I'll come back to that in a moment. K25, if you haven't been there, please go out. We had almost 14,000 people go through last year. So it's being discovered, unlike AMSI, which opened in 1949 in different locations, K25 is a baby. It just opened in 2020 and people are discovering it. It tells the story of the creation of Oak Ridge and Manhattan Project, but all focused on that uh, amazing K25 gaseous diffusion plant that served during the Manhattan Project and into the Cold War to process uranium. So Really an amazing story, amazingly well told. 
Um, I can say that without uh, seeming arrogant because I had nothing to do with the exhibit design. It was all done when I got here, but really well done. Uh, we now have a temporary photo exhibit in there from the Park Service uh, telling further the story of uranium enrichment, and we're working internally on the next couple of special exhibits uh, that will go in there in the future. So if you haven't made the trip, it's about a 15-minute drive out the turnpike right next to where the, the plant used to be. Um, uh, please do go out there. I will tell you, uh, they're also planning what's called the platform building. Uh, we think that construction will start uh, this year. Uh, the Department of Energy Environmental Management um, is working on that. That will be a platform with exhibits um, uh, interpretation that overlooks the site of where the building used to be. The actual site of where the building, the plant used to be, is part of that Manhattan Project National Historic Park. And the MPS, the Park Service, will have wayfinding signs around that footprint. So uh, we want to partner with them in many ways. And Obviously, on this property, we're right next to where the park is. So that platform building, we hope in the next couple of years or so, will be there and we'll help operate that as well. And we're even looking into, uh, if we can find funding, uh, renovating the portal as you enter the property and utilizing that as a welcome center shop, a place for food trucks, rental of golf carts to drive the site, that type of thing. So we have great plans uh, for the site. And I'm excited that people are starting to uh, starting to discover what is really just a terrific museum. Now we have a couple things at AMSI coming up um, that I want to tell you about. On February 24th, we open our newest a special exhibit called Let's Play, all about electronic games. So if you've ever played Pong, which I remember getting my first Pong set, um, that is going to be something you can play. We have a pinball machine that's opened up in the back and you can see how it works, a whole host of games and telling kind of the, the evolution of those and a little bit about the workings of those. It's already generating quite a buzz in the community, I will tell you. <laughs> and I may have donated a few of my old handheld electronic games from the 70s uh, to go in that exhibit. We also just opened uh, a new addition to the permanent exhibit all about the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so there you see just a quick photo. We mimicked some of the mirrors on the Webb telescope. You see the screen in the middle of it on the top showing images from the telescope. What you can't see here is we have other interactives behind those temporary walls. Uh, one kiosk from NASA showing various images of space that you can choose and zoom in on. Uh, we have sounds of the universe. Uh, so you can hear you know, the wind on Mars or uh, thunder crashing, that type of thing on Titan. Um, and then the most unique one, which I didn't know about until our great curator, Quinn Argall, told me this, is that they've said that space has a certain smell to it. Uh, and it's not a real pleasant smell, but we have replicated it. And you can push a little button and smell what space smells like. I'll warn you, just do it very gently and then back away. <laughs> it is. We thought we would, in, we would engage all the senses in this new James Webb Space Telescope exhibit. So come and see that now. And on February 24th, that new electronic games exhibit will have the uh, ribbon cutting at 11 that morning. And then it will be open after that for until probably this fall. And then we're starting to plan what will come in after electronic games is going to focus on uh, nuclear energy um, and some of the advances being made right here in Oak Ridge on that. So a lot of things happening at AMSI. Uh, not as much at K25 because it's a new museum. So now we're, mainly what we're focusing on there is the new buildings there and the special exhibits that will go in in the future. We also, in terms of looking just at the museums and our collections, Quinn also oversees the DOE collection as well as the, the AMSI Foundation collection. And on the latter, we just got a great donation from the William Rands III estate. Um, Dr. Rands, uh, family was connected with us by Dr. John Rather, who lives here in Oak Ridge. And it was just an amazing assortment of scientific equipment that Dr. Rands had collected over his lifetime. And they donated much of it to us. So we now have that in storage and we're going to see how do we use this in exhibits and educational programs. There you see just a couple pieces from the many hundreds of items that they, uh, they donated to us just recently. So those are the exhibits. Um, 
programming is really strong here now. You know, over the pandemic, we had to figure out how do we connect with people virtually? And now we're getting back into in-person events as well. But it's a hybrid model. We're keeping both going. So uh, if you, as Ray mentioned earlier, if you go into any podcast channel, you can find AMSICast. I'm really proud of that podcast. It's, I think, around 50 episodes now. Uh, it's I'm booking guests through this coming June as we speak. Uh, so it's, it's a very uh, vibrant podcast with historians, scientists, science writers, science fiction writers. I've hit, I try to hit just about every topic possible in the world of science and engineering and the Manhattan Project, science history, uh, really interesting guests. We've had everyone from Heino Falke, who uh, was part of the team to take the first image of a black hole, to Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian. Uh, I'm getting ready to interview, I can't remember the guy's name, that's horrible, isn't it? He, he wrote a book called How the Hippies Save Physics. So, you know, I'm finding all these great books and the, the interesting thing is now publishers have heard about us and they're reaching out saying, hey, will you feature you know, this, this author on your podcast? So it's, it's making an impact for sure. Uh, we also have an online book club once a month. Uh, we say this is our featured book and I pontificate on it on our Facebook page. And uh, we certainly would love for you to take part in that and give us your comments on those books as well. Uh, this month we're reading The 300, all about a missile defense system um, in, in America, uh, written by Dan Washably, a really fascinating look at that uh, defense missile system, kind of relevant today. Uh, we also continue to have the Race to Space, which is a virtual virtual race you sign up for, and, and you pay an entry fee, but you get a t-shirt, and then as you reach different levels of the atmosphere uh, on your way to the space station as you walk or run, we send you 3D printed medals. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can sign up for all this on our website, that's amz.org. And we'll show you that address a little bit later too. And then the last thing I would say, we're getting ready to take our AMZ quiz back out in the road. We've done it a couple of times. We now are getting a lot of interest, especially from bars, admittedly, in Knoxville for us to come down and do our science quiz. Um, we take little, little prizes as you get, as the questions get harder, the prizes get better, uh, including if you answer the fifth really hard question, you get a, a year membership to AMZ. And a couple of people have done that. So um, I got a little obsessed with that and came up with just under 600 questions and uh, I'm ready to go. So look soon, we'll put that on our Facebook page, on our website when we get those scheduled. Uh, family game night's coming up too. So we opened that electronic games exhibit here on the 24th that morning. That evening from five to 7.30, we'll have our second AMZ game night. So mainly board games uh, in our classroom you come in, we'll have popcorn and drinks. It's a fun, fun night. And each game in some way relates to STEM. So we have a little card beside it saying, you know, if, you're, if your child plays this game or you play this game, here's a STEM element to it that you can learn and in a fun way learn, right? So last time we had about 50 or 60 people come to it. We want even more this time. So make plans to come. It's a fun night. Uh, some games you'll know, some games I didn't know existed, uh, but were a lot of fun. So. Uh, make sure you make plans to come on the 24th for that. Uh, we've all, that's kind of a frightening photo. I don't know up front, you see <laughs> the bee coming at you, but we had our, our first program on what we're calling the SIP of Science series. And that, that specific program focused on pollen power. And we talked all about pollination. Happened just um, a couple months ago. We're going to have these on a fairly regular basis. We think the next one will be in June. Uh, on most likely on nuclear energy, but we're, we're still putting that together. And there'll be at least two of these a year in the series. So SIPA science is the general heading, and then there'll be different topics under that. Um, we typically will have food and drink and vendors coming in related to the topic in some way, uh, a lot of fun activities, not just speakers, but educational activities as well. Uh, so SIPA of science, I learned a lot about wasps and bees. And I, I tried to tell people growing up on a farm in Kentucky mowing yards, they mainly like to attack me, but I now realize how important they are to our, our ecosystem for sure. And then I will say also, as, as many of you know, I'm sure we help with the Department of Energy's uh, bus tours. And we're working with them now, as Ray knows, to restart these most likely in early April um, of this year. Uh, that was uh, no longer any restrictions on it in terms of 
uh, the pandemic. So uh, we'll be able to fill those buses up. If you go to amzi.org at the time, that's where you make your, your reservation for those busters. And you'll see a button on there. Uh, not doing that yet, but soon that will be, that will be possible to do. Uh, a little different this year in that uh, the, the middle stop, typically you start at AMC, you go to the K-25 History Center, you go to the Graphite Reactor, and you go to Y-12 Visitor Center. But this year, uh, given the construction around the Graphite Reactor, that's not going to be on the tour. Uh, so we're trying now to work with DOE to find something in the middle part of the tour that's historic, that helps tell the story uh, that will uh, that will be part of that tour. So I guess to be announced, that's still being discussed with them right now of what that stop will be, but we're working hard with them to figure that out. So again, those start, we think the tentative date is April 13th, and uh, we'll, we'll confirm that soon for sure. So what would be your date to put them up online so that people can sign up? As, uh, by the end of this month, I wanna yeah. do that, Ray. And we're working now backing up from April 13th with DOE. Uh, we, we aren't putting it up yet only because we don't know the middle stop. Got it. So we want to be able to say to people, this is where you're going to go on the tour. So, and we just don't know which of the options that were put forth are going to be approved by DOE. Now, I, I realize so, we're having to delay a start this year. Most people expect it to start in March. So if you go ahead yeah. and don't put that up as soon as you get the information, I think you will have yep. people who will appreciate knowing when they're going to start. So just put it up. Soon. Absolutely. I will. will. I, I want I want to do it really soon. And I want to. Um, figure out where the heck we're going to start stop in the middle because as you know yeah. we got to write rewrite a script yeah. for our, our wonderful volunteers to be able to talk about whatever that middle part is <laughs> so that's now, why we've delayed uh, a Alan, bit because you know, you know, Alan's not wanting yeah. to tell you this but I will <laughs> <laughs> they can't do anything to me um, we're hoping to get <laughs> to the new Bethel church and be able to share that very historic church with uh, good exhibits inside it uh, there is some concern about the structure, but I, I feel confident that we'll figure out how to do that and uh, yeah. can get that get, can get that done. Now, mm -hmm. and also I want to add, Alan, this is as good a place as any to add it. That's yes. the uh, uh, building 9731 at Y12. It's, there's mm -hmm. construction going on now to build bathrooms up on the first floor. And eventually, I, and I obviously can't give you any kind of a date, but eventually we're gonna be able to include that in tours. That's the yeah. reason that it's being done. It's gonna be yeah. months away, but the, the tours will change as we have opportunities coming to us to add additional insights. The other uh, thing that we have is the George Jones Memorial Baptist Church, and it's never been mm -hmm. on the tour, but it's a, it's an option mm -hmm. that we may want to talk with DOE about. So yeah. Uh, yeah. just bear in mind that, that we want to retain as much flexibility as we can, but we do need to get those tours uh, up and going, and, and everybody understands that. We just want to do it as best we can. So right. just wanted to add that comment. No, I appreciate that, Ray. You know, we're we uh, we fully agree with you on that, and making sure that middle stop is something excellent. We want to make sure people get value for their for their money, so um, and they get a good a good picture of Oak Ridge. So, um, Tony Schnadelbach is our new director of volunteers and programs, and he is on it. Uh, he's uh, providing a schedule to DOE, saying if we're going to start on this date, we have to know. Where we're stopping by this date so we can write the script and train the volunteers and so forth and i'll go ahead and put out the pitch now i was going to put out later if any of you are interested in being volunteers on that bus tour or otherwise at amz or k25 please let me know tony uh, just came on board about a month ago he's terrific i stole him from uh, the department of museum and archives down in mississippi and uh, he replaces uh, glenda bingham who was here for 30 plus years and just an institution here and she retired and uh, no one can replace Glenda, but Tony's uh, doing a great job. And uh, so he, he's heading up that volunteer training for the bus tour and all the other volunteer work here. So uh, that being said, the other program I want to tell all of you about is on April the 22nd, the evening of April 22nd, 
we'll have our really our first AMSI gala fundraising gala since we took over operations of both museums in 2021. Uh, we're going to honor the inaugural recipients of what we're calling the AMSI Excellence Award. Uh, Thomas Zachariah and Jim Roberto are being honored with that. And we also, that evening, uh, are going to announce the winners of our first STEAM art contest. So we opened this up a few months, two months ago, I guess. It's extended through March 24th. Um, every year we'll do this associated with the gala and have a different topic. This year, the topic is uh, the periodic table of elements uh, because we've just established our 117 society named after element 117, have our highest tier membership level. So we said this year to artists, give us something. Uh, and we had some rules on it uh, based on an element or the periodic table of elements. And we're getting overwhelmed with, with entries now. It's terrific to see, excuse me, a lot of people have artistic talent that I do not have. And you can see it on display. We're starting now to pepper the exhibit with some of the entries, and we will announce the winners on April 22nd at the gala. So please, either it's up now or soon will be up the uh, information on our website about the gala, how you can buy tickets. If you know anyone interested in sponsorships, send them our way. It's going to be a fun, fun night, and it will be at the Double Tree here in Oak Ridge. Education, central to what we do. Uh, if you've heard me before, I beat this drum a lot. That's what we're about. Uh, teaching everyone who comes in here about STEAM and STEM, of inspiring them, uh, hopefully of um, you know, telling the students that come in, not only is this important to know, but maybe this could be a career for you, a kind of workforce development element. Uh, we do a lot here. Uh, classes come in, we have topics they can choose, and our educators work with them. Uh, we have an educator that goes out into classrooms, and more and more of my educators are doing that. And then we uh, are continuing the virtual approach as well. And that's often with the support of uh, ORNLs, giving us a couple grants to do that. We wanna continue that and grow that because then we can reach kids and teachers here, but also all over the country uh, with our expertise. But one thing I was talking to my crew about the other day is how do we extend our expertise? We're one of the few places that helps the Boy Scouts uh, obtain their nuclear science merit badge. So how can we work with more Boy Scout troops uh, around the region? And how can we perhaps uh, have partners in other regions of the country that we help train and provide that same service, say in the Northwest or the Southwest or the Northeast of the kids that can't come here? Uh, so that's the kind of thing we're trying to see now. Of how do we use this virtual element and partnerships to extend our educational reach? We will have our summer camp this year, uh, June 19th through the 23rd here at AMSI. Uh, it's uh, focusing on space again, it's called To the Moon and Beyond. The educators have put together a great itinerary for the week, uh, still putting the final touches on it, but it's very close and you can go online now and sign up it's for middle school students. Uh, so if you know any middle schoolers who are uh, excited about space or you think could be excited about space, uh, have them sign up, it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of great um, participatory type stuff uh, throughout that week here at AMSI. I'll put in one more pitch, volunteers. Um, it's been always my experience at all the museums I've helped direct uh, that volunteers are the kind of the soul of the place. Uh, it's such an important part of the team. They certainly are here at AMSI and K25. So if you're ever interested, let me know, let Tony Schnaudelbach know, we can always share this contact information. Uh, we'd love to have you be part of the, uh, the AMZ Foundation family. Here's some of our, uh, our website, our Facebook, Twitter, which I admittedly am still figuring out, uh, but those are our websites, amz.org and k25historycenter.org. And also I put these on, we now have an electronic newsletter we send out the first of every month. You can sign up for that newsletter on amz.org. Kind of go to the bottom of the page. You'll see where you can sign up. We also have started with our, our partners, a company called Track 15. They're, they're helping us with some marketing and fundraising. They've started working with us to do an every other week email to uh, people who sign up for it called Elements of Surprise. And we're still figuring out where on the, on the website to put that sign up. But if you're interested in getting those as well, just let me know for now, and we'll put you on that list. 
elements of surprise are different science topics every time, kind of a surprising thing or an interesting thing uh, that we in some way talk about here at AMSI or in our programs. And it's a fun, fun every other week email that goes out to a whole host of people. So we have the monthly newsletter and those every other week elements of surprise. If you're interested in either one, um, let me know. We'd love to have you uh, get those every month. And that is it for me. I think that's all, almost all the new stuff. I'm sure I've forgotten something. This is a really busy, vibrant place. I'm proud of the crew we have, of the volunteers we have, and we have an excellent board that supports us and helps make sure that uh, we're accomplishing what I think is a really important mission. We're proud to be part of Oak Ridge and uh, really, really happy to be doing what we do to help prepare that next generation. So with that, any questions you might have about what we're doing, I'd be glad to take. So just unmute yourself if you have a question for Alan, please. I have been very, Alan, very I, comprehensive. I've got oh, one. Um, okay, I, my picture's not up because I'm not dressed, but um, no, I got it. Right. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about working with the schools in terms of advertising the camp. Are yes. you all doing that? We are, as my understanding, we have, have established good contacts with the schools. I'll make double sure that we've done okay. that because uh, it. We literally just over the past week we've gotten the the graphic together and the itinerary together. So I'm going to make sure that we've done that outreach. Typically we do, but I will okay. make sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, I just uh, wanted to know. I've got a, a rising seventh grader, oh, and great. I think he might be interested in the camp. Oh, good, good, good. Yes, absolutely. And I will double check and make sure. But yeah, uh, the okay, information either is on our website now or should be on this week with that graphic and the, the ability to sign up for it. So yeah, thank you. Could you tell me the dates again? I know you said June something, but I didn't write it down. That's 19th through the 23rd of June. Okay, thank you. Sure. And thank you for your presentation. That was very good. Well, thank you. Uh, I like what I do. I'm sure. I'm sure Oak Ridge likes what you do too. Well, I hope so. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Ann. Any All other right. questions for Alan? Don't be bashful now. Speak up if you have. <laughs> All right. We, we've All right. Time to it, Alan. Stop sharing your screen. All right. And uh, we oh, yes. really do appreciate you coming on and giving us a fine update on what's going on with the, uh, with the two museums that, uh, that you talked to us about. All right. Any, any other questions or comments? Last chance on Alan. He's probably going to leave us. We've got <laughs> something else to do this morning. I'm, I'm going. <laughs> all right. Great to see you all. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. See you now. All right, come see us. Yep. Okay, right. hey, I'm going to uh, give you a chance to ask any questions you have you want of me. Please remember, I'm dead serious about wanting you to interrupt me and ask questions. So don't don't be hesitant. But uh, I'm going to go now back to my slides, and I'm going down to this one. All right. And I think I want to talk about a uh, presentation that I put together for the Daughters of the American Revolution <clears throat> down in Cleveland, Tennessee. And what they asked me about, <clears throat> excuse me, what they asked me about was the Revolutionary War veterans or uh, soldiers, for the most part, who are buried in Oak Ridge. So I put together a presentation that <clears throat> identified, well, I, I used uh, I used some input from Fred Eiler and Dennis Egert. Dennis did most of the work to put this presentation together. <clears throat> what you're looking at here is a plaque that's in, uh, in Clinton that talks about the Revolutionary War veterans in Anderson County. And uh, I gave them a couple of shots of it so they could recognize some of the names, William Scarborough 
uh, is in Oak Ridge. Uh, Reuben Roberts, William Roberts. Uh, let's see. There was another name. Joseph Frost, of course, would have been over in Frost Bottom. Duncan's. Armstrong's. You'll see some of these names coming up. So here's where we used a lot of the information at the time of the Revolutionary War, areas like Tennessee were largely unsettled by the white settlers, so just a few outlying forts and posts. But uh, when they finished their terms of service, these soldiers received grants for land in the frontier areas. Many of them had formative roles in the expansion and uh, including uh, the area that's now the state of Tennessee. So in the Treaty of the Holston in July the 1st, 1791, the Cherokee Nation retained the lands from the Powell Valley southward, including what would become Robertsville and Scarborough and uh, Wheat, Wheat, those communities that were here before the Manhattan Project. And, and the Yuchi tribe lived along the Clinch River. I have to say that every time I get a chance because a good friend of mine is a uh, descendant of the Yuchi and he wants me to be sure and say that the Cherokee were not on the Clinch River, they were south of here. But as you'll notice, they were the ones that were treating with the white settlers about which lands they could settle on. And, uh, and they did not, they, in 91, they excluded what's now the, well, well, what was in too, the Clinch River in that area. Yet the white settlers were settling on that land in violation of the treaty. North Carolina, which if you remember before 1796, we were either a part of North Carolina or a part of the ter Southwest Territory until we became a state. So they were, settling this area and and giving grants to these revolutionary war soldiers what would become robertsville there are some surveys that were found dennis found them and looking back at who actually uh were first to own who are the white settlers were first to own the land that is now oak ridge so when he he turned these surveys up and uh some of them actually arrived here before 1798 and bought land without cleared land titles. And uh, you, you might remember that uh, some of the people who were actually selling that land were uh, blunt and uh, uh, I can't, can't remember his name. But anyway, they, they were selling land that actually did not, they did not have ownership of or the right to sell, but they did. Samuel Worthington family, you know, we have the Worthington Cemetery on the east end of Oak Ridge. They were here in 97, William Tunnell owned a massive estate in uh, Buckhorn Valley, <laughs> just outside of Robertsville. And it's on the north side of Black Oak Ridge. The Tunnel Farm is still over there. Uh, certainly influencing the early settlement. 1795, the Jones and the Peak families. Now, the Peak families lived right where Robertsville was and where Oak Ridge is today. The, uh, the uh, Civic Center is actually located on the peak land. And there's two cemeteries. One's over in uh, Gamble Valley in the Scarborough community. And one's behind the, uh, behind the church, the uh, Episcopal church uh, up on uh, just off of uh, the turnpike. So they had that, that property in Gamble Valley and also the land that was condemned in 1942. The Oliver family, of course, Oliver Springs is name, named for the Oliver family. And uh, uh, Richard and Douglas uh, 
settled actually near Rob, Robertsville today. He, at one time, one of these Douglases, or I'm sorry, one of these Olivers, I think it was Douglas, had a, uh, owned what's now the, the outdoor swimming pool. <laughs> and he actually made liquor there and uh, had, a, had a steel using that water. But the, the Emory Road is the first road that ran from East Tennessee, what is now East Tennessee, to Nashville in Middle Tennessee. It was cut and cleared in, in, uh, in 1787, so it would have been part of North Carolina at the time. But that road came right through what was Robertsville and what's now Black Oak Ridge. And interesting to note, there's a bridge right between the high school and the Midtown Community Center or the Oak Ridge History Museum that uh, was put on that route in around 19, about 1906. And that bridge is still there today. You can see one portion of it is leaning out into the creek and I'm trying to get that repaired and uh, get the city to create a park around that little bridge. And I'm, I'm glad to note that at the very last time I saw Mark Watson make a presentation about the city, he included this bridge as something that the city was looking at for uh, restoration and for protection to keep it. I'm not sure what will be done, but at least uh, we have it on the, on the city's screen now. They've been out and looked at it. I brought the state historian here, Patrick McIntyre, and he was uh, excited to see that we had this opportunity. And I'm sure that we will be able to preserve it. So after the Treaty of Teleco, the Emory Road took a more southwesterly route toward Kingston, branched off the original, and uh, the community saw another milestone. The East Fork Baptist Church was formed here in 1799. Although it was located outside of Robertsville, it served the Robertsville community and uh, continued for a, for a long period of time. This is kind of show you the original Robertsville land grants, how they were laid out. There's Black Oak Ridge, you see, running along the back there. And then here you note Pilot Knob, Lee's Ford was on the Clinch River and it was on the Emory Road. Uh, and here's Pine Ridge. And then of course the East Fork of Poplar Creek coming out of Bear Creek Valley where Y-12 is today, flowing through the ridge there by Scarborough Road and then going on out west. And these are the primary land grants and you see them listed up here, uh, who they were and how they were transferred originally. Now, here are some links that I've used to do some of this research. And I, I put this up because I think some people might be interested in doing more in-depth research of how these land grants came to be and and how how they uh, how that how the land has developed over time. Bill Carey is a good friend of mine. He has the uh, website Tennessee History for Kids, and he wrote an article for the Tennessee Magazine about the Revolutionary War veterans buried all over Tennessee. And if you're interested in that, I would highly recommend his article. Uh, in the Tennessee Magazine. So the Oak Ridge cemeteries, there's some over 70 cemeteries in Oak Ridge. Most of them have been maintained. Many of them are on federal lands with limited access, but there's a list of them all available at the uh, Oak Ridge Public Library. And when you go there, you're gonna find that not only are the cemeteries listed and a photograph of the cemeteries, They'll uh, give you access to uh, the research that was done to identify who's buried there. And also there was a young 
Boy Scout a number of years ago that wanted to provide GPS location for all of the cemeteries. So I took him to all of them on the federal reservation and he put down the GPS locations for them. And of course he did that for all within the city of Oak Ridge. He could do that on his own, but uh, I gave him access to get into the ones that are behind the fences and on the Y-12, ORNL and K-25 sites. So that information is all available in the uh, in the Oak Ridge room, or actually at that at that uh, link that I've given you there at the Oak Ridge Public Library. So there are also historically speaking columns that I've written on the Revolutionary uh, Soldiers buried in Oak Ridge. I published. Uh, them in 2021, uh, looks like January of 2021, the 11th and the 25th. And uh, if you if you ever want to look at any of my historically speaking articles, I've written them since 2006, and they're all online in an archive that I keep. And the archive is this link, uh, Smith D Ray One dot net and slash historically speaking if you put at put that much information in your google it'll bring it up you just actually if you just put smith d ray and historically speaking uh without any quotes or anything just put those words in google it's amazing it'll bring it up <laughs> I, I tell you i don't know what we did before google any any time now that I have any question I want to think about, I just Google it. Just put that question in and let that uh, let that software do its thing. It's amazing how well it can bring things up. So just my name, but I've put it in there, Smith D. Ray, and then historically speaking, we'll bring that whole list. Uh, from 2006 to 2023, they're all out there. So the ones buried in Oak Ridge, finally getting to those, uh, and they are are buried here. They're surely patriots. Uh, three of them established farms along the East Fork Poplar Creek. Three others uh, established bottom lands on the Clinch River. Uh, another one settled along the banks further down into uh, of the creek, down into Roan County. One owned a massive plantation that's now downtown Oak Ridge. And one who is interned on the reservation lived just out the reservation, outside the boundary. And the last one, we don't really know where that person is, but we're going to give you a list of them here now. Let's see how I'm doing on time. I'm still all right. Little is known about Thomas Jones. What did he do in the country? But he is uh, he was a Revolutionary War, served as a fly officer in, in Virginia militia. Uh, he was original settler, arrived here in this area about 1795, owned 100 acres or over 100 acres along East Fork. That's in downtown Oak Ridge today. Uh, his uh, youngest daughter married Jacob Peak. Now, while they were in Virginia, but then the Joneses and the Peaks probably traveled to East Tennessee as a family group. Uh, Jacob went on to become an influential and wealthy individual in the community, owned over 400 acres in Gamble Valley. It, it adjoined the Jones land, so the Peaks and the Jones. He died in 1815, and because he was married to the daughter uh, of Mary, it is probable that he was buried in the Peak Family Cemetery located in Gamble Valley. Now there is no tombstone there. There's only a few, one or two in that cemetery. There are several uh, field stones and there are obvious depressions where you can see graves, but uh, this cemetery, one of the most pristine historic cemeteries in Oak Ridge. Well, there's the point. Only two tombstones can be found there. 
and others can be recognized. Then there's William Griffith, another Virginian who came here and uh, served in the Virginia mil militia. He participated in three separate engagements, uh, qualified for a Revolutionary War pension, but he refused to apply. Uh, his son documented in an affidavit that his father said he could live well without a pension and he'd rather his government would have his services so that in the future war, she might be able to feed and clothe her army. So he turned down his pension. Uh, he, although he refused his pension, his wife did apply for it after he died <laughs> because without her sworn testimony, we wouldn't even know about his service. Settled in about 1796, 1100 acres uh, between Oak Ridge and Oliver Springs. Although he lived outside the reservation, he was buried in the cemetery where his father-in-law, Thomas Jones, may also be buried. So it's the best example of a documented burial that uh, Dennis was able to find. So he's in the Peak Cemetery, again, over in Gamble Valley. Douglas Oliver, uh, uh, again, Virginia militia, uh, his service included marching against the British at Potomac, James and York Rivers, Williamsburg, Pittsburgh, Petersburg, Norfolk, and then uh, on his final tour, he participated in campaigns against the uh, Indians, Native Americans, and uh, Chillicothe and Pickwick Town. Here, he said there was a hard fight. Original settler in what was to come Oak Ridge. Uh, he was in East Tennessee, purchased 350 acres, and uh, they had 10 children. He became one of the wealthiest and most prominent citizens living here. He owned 1,268 acres, and that's right where the high school is, a municipal complex, downtown shopping area. On one of the largest, if not the largest, legal moonshine stills in the country, in the county. Spring that fed is is the same spring that feeds the municipal outdoor swimming pool today. <laughs> when he died, one person owed him for 50 gallons of moonshine. <laughs> uh, he died in 1843 and was buried near his house on a small knoll on the land he owned. And uh, Eventually, the land containing this knoll where Douglas is believed to be buried was sold to the Peck family. Uh, it continued to be used as a family cemetery, and others are known to be buried there. But they also think that Douglas Oliver was likely buried there as well. And then Henry Nunley, uh, again, we're back up into Virginia, but... Uh, he uh, he was at the siege of Yorktown. Uh, we know little about him, only that in 1803, he owned 100 acres along East Fort Poplar Creek. He sold the land in 1809. And uh, then he's not in the 1810, 20, and 30 census. He remains missing, but he did apply for a Revolutionary War pension in 1832 while living here. Uh, in 1807, his wife died, let's see, two daughters, and he died in 38, no information on his final resting place. He may have lived with his daughter or Charles Oliver, possibility that he could be in the Peck Cemetery, but again, no real proof of that. Then Samuel Worthington, uh, the Worthington Cemetery is on the east end of Oak Ridge. And uh, he purchased in 1795, 640 acres from a land grant owned by William Russell, land speculator, William Blunt. And uh, the other guy was named Richardson, I believe, that was selling all this land. Uh, it was located on the northernmost area of Oak Ridge north and, and east, and followed the bank of the Clinch River from Pilot Knob to beyond Elza. Uh, 
he may have been living here earlier than he actually bought the land, not sure. But they were selling here, he's talking about the Blunt and Russell was selling land without clear titles because of the dates and the uh, also the dates of the uh, treaties with the Cherokee. He died in 1821 and buried, probably buried in the uh, Worthington Cemetery. Again, no tombstone there, but the uh, cemetery still exists today. And uh, this is a map of the cemeteries that we know that have, uh, or we think, have Revolutionary War uh, soldiers buried in them. And they're all listed down here with numbers to point to the location of where those cemeteries actually are located in the community. Here's uh, the sign marking the Peak Cemetery. And as you can see, there's just a, a, a slightly cleared area. This was the original marking put on them when they were identified uh, as being on part of the reservation many years ago. Uh, this is the Peak Cemetery behind the St. Stephen's Episcopal Church that uh, was on the peak land as well. And then Joseph England uh, was in the North Carolina militia. So we've gotten out of Virginia finally. And then uh, uh, these are the tours that he was in. And very little is known about where he lived, just enough information to know that, that he was in this area in the early 1800s. Uh, he had 10 individuals living with him in 1830, got a pension payment, 34. Uh, final resting place is in the Worthington Cemetery based on some research done by the Daughters of the American Revolution. There's no headstone to mark his exact grave. Uh, drummer boy, William Cross, uh, he uh, and his two had two brothers all three volunteered to serve in the North Carolina militia. He was at an age of 14 or at best 15, and he was a drummer boy. And uh, in 1818, he moved from Knox County to Anderson County, bought 174 acres on the East Fork of Poplar Creek at the Pine Ridge Gap that now separates the city from Oak Ridge and or separates Oak Ridge from Y12. He settled and became the patriarch of a large, large multi-generational family. He died in 1844. And, and let's see. Considering his young age and where his, was he related and other questions about it, somewhere closer to his farm in the Pine Ridge Gap. And we really don't know that much about him, but he is now recently honored with a marker in the prominent Britain Cross Historic Family Cemetery on Highway 95, just beyond the Oak Ridge City limits going toward Clinton. So it's just outside <coughs> Oak Ridge on the right going toward Clinton, just after you go under the railroad bridge <coughs> and go across the top of the hill there. James Scarborough and William Scarborough, they, uh, they were in the Virginia uh, militia and had these fights with all of the Native Americans. And uh, this, those, in 1803, they settled here in the land over on Bethel Valley, where, which, which was Scarborough, named for them. And uh, it was first known as, as Live Well Lick or Lick Skillet. You, you, it's amazing what you find. Then it, be, it became Scarborough with that spelling. And now today we know it as this spelling of Scarborough, that's C-A-R-B-O-R-O. -O. They had three mills along that, uh, that stream that was flowing over there. They dammed the creek up. They owned and, and operated an inn. First ferry in Anderson County crossed the Clinch River 
was located there where the old Solway Bridge, or where the new one is today, but very near where the old one was too. So they had an inn, uh, mills and ferry boat, and uh, were privileged status, if you will, in, uh, in, in the community. Uh, in 1821, he, he donated, William donated uh, an acre of his land to build a Methodist meeting house. It's probably located where the old Scarborough School stands today, which is part of Oak Ridge Associated University's South Campus. They're at the corner of Scarborough Road, Pump House Road, and Bethel Valley Road. Most likely buried near James Scarborough, most likely buried on the knoll near his home. And ultimately, they, they made that into a community cemetery. And uh, <laughs> such as were the ones located to the churches. By the way, here's a little interesting side note. Do you know the difference between a cemetery and a, and a, and a graveyard? I didn't until just a little bit ago. And I found out that the difference is this. A cemetery does not, is not associated with a church. A graveyard is associated with a church. So if it's associated with a church, it's called a graveyard. But if it's not associated with a church, it's called a cemetery. Now, that doesn't hold a lot of the markers that I've seen identify church cemeteries. But by the official meaning of the words, a cemetery does not have a church associated with it. So they're probably uh, uh, buried in the Scarborough Cemetery uh, out near the uh, east, out near the uh, south campus. Elias Roberts uh, probably came from Pennsylvania, Quaker family, uh, Zacchaeus, uh, Roberts, they all, they both came here. Uh, they were in Battles of Charleston. They married sisters, the Brashear sisters, Nancy and Rebecca. And then uh, they came with the Brashears in, into the upper area of Roan County, <clears throat> the land along Poplar Creek that would become part of the uranium enrichment complex or K-25 established their farm, raised 10 children, and they were buried in the Roberts Family Cemetery located near the banks of Poplar Creek. And uh, the descendants would go swimming on the opposite shore of the creek where it meandered around the family cemetery. Swimming hole became known as Granny's Bluff. Ultimately, the Roberts family and the cemetery was sold and then in 42, the army purchased the land for the Manhattan Project. And when they did that, they surveyed the area. They could only identify the location of the cemetery by informants only. There wasn't anything there, no tombstones or anything to mark it. All of the headstones and fieldstones were missing. A previous landowner had thoughtlessly removed the grain stones, grave stones, and converted to Robert's Family Cemetery to pasture land. And uh, after the government got the land, they did groundwork to uh, build the K-31 uranium uh, enrichment building. And when they did that, they, they covered the Robert Cemetery with about three feet of field dirt. So the cemetery is now under some additional dirt and uh, it's been deactivated. So it's now the Heritage Center of the East Tennessee oh. Technology Park, but that's where Private Elias Roberts is buried in that field near the near Poplar Creek. Now we put a stone up to honor that uh, Roberts family in the George Jones uh, Church near the uh, it's not a Presbyterian church, that's a mistake. It's a Baptist church. The, the Presbyterian was located on down the road a little bit. Sorry about that mistake. But this is the stone 
Now that's the Worthington Cemetery. This is the stone I was talking about. That's out at the uh, cemetery, or the <laughs> graveyard by the uh, George Jones Memorial Baptist Church. And this is a good write up about Elias and Zacchaeus Robert and they're marrying the Brashears. And I'm going to skip over this, not thinking you'll have too much interest in that. But I want to show you, as I wind up here, the, the one that the, the Revolutionary War soldier that I'm most familiar with. I grew up in Middle Tennessee, went to school at a little place called Petersburg. <clears throat> and Joseph Greer got his 600 acres, I believe. Uh, he was in that area of Petersburg where I grew up. He fought at King's Mountain, was chosen to deliver the news of the victory to Congress. The journey, mostly on foot from Southern Appalachia to Philadelphia was treacherous. At least one occasion, Greer hid in a holler log to avoid being captured by the enemy. When he got to the Congress hall, the Sergeant at arms tried to block his way as he entered the chamber. He pushed the officer aside, announcing to Congress that an army of frontiersmen had crushed Patrick Ferguson's Tory army at King's Mountain. <laughs> Here, here's what George Washington had to say about Joseph Greer. With soldiers like him, no wonder the frontiersmen won. Joseph Greer is buried in Petersburg in Lincoln County. And the last time I was there, the site was in good condition. It isn't easy to find. Do your research and don't hesitate to ask. It's in a very isolated area of Middle Tennessee in Lincoln County. And uh, that's the end of that presentation. Now, as I mentioned to you, we're almost to the end of our time today. Any last questions you have or comments you'd like to make? And uh, I remind you that we will have another guest next Monday as well. Any thoughts or questions? Well, there goes my alarm. Thank you for being with me today. I look forward to our session next, uh, next Monday as well. So have a good week. And we'll see. Thanks, you. Ray. That yeah. was Thank good. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank so, you. Glad to do it. Oh, I've got a question here. Okay, she can't hear any more. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yes, Vicki, I can give a PDF of that lecture. I'll do that. And uh, this other comment, kept hearing about all the new jobs in the Oak Ridge facility. They are hiring. And coming in from Kingston reminds me of what it looked like back in the 70s. Highways full of cars headed toward Y-12 and Ornell. Where would one see job openings online? If you go to either the uh, Y-12 website or the Oak Ridge National Laboratory website, they post the listing of the jobs regularly and routinely on the website. That's the place to start. If you have any question or want to refer anyone to a job in Oak Ridge, get them online to the websites and that will get them started. All right. See you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.